Watching this video, and of course hearing its sounds, may have left you as confused and as irritated as my parents felt when I started tinkering with electronics years ago in high school. They are not sounds that we typically deem musical or even pleasant, nor is the process of inviting noise and error and irregularity into our relationships with technology a particularly enjoyable experience. But for many circuit vendors, these experiences are instructive, powerful, and expressive. Further, because I've been circuit vending and tinkering with electronics for much longer than I've been an academic, the practice philosophies of circuit vending have always lived in and impacted my practices as a researcher, teacher, and rhetorician. The more M.A. and I discussed circuit bending and our own approaches to rhetoric and composition, the more we realized that bringing some of these philosophy practices to life in our relation to our field was a worthwhile endeavor. For this special issue of Harlot, M.A. and I circuit bent a Casio SK-1 and began making connections between the work of Cubes Reed Gazala, the pioneer of circuit bending, and rhetoric and composition. Circuit bending was an accidental discovery in Cincinnati, Ohio in the late 1960s. This is the circuit, not the instrument, but the circuit, that started the whole circuit bending revolution in 1966-67. Uh, that circuit shorted out in my desk drawer, started making very strange, oscillating, sweeping sounds over and over again. Immediately I thought, if that can happen by accident, what might happen on purpose if I began shorting uh, battery-powered audio electronics, shorting it out here, there, and everywhere. And that led to what I ended up uh, calling circuit bending. And, and when I came up with the term circuit bending, it was actually based upon the idea of mind bending, a mind bending experience. This is what we talked about back then, so circuit bending sort of came out of that idea. Basically, all, you, all of our good stuff is going to be here because this is the, the sound synthesis chip and so all of these little leads are running out. By stability, I mean circuit bending. Uh it's spelunking in circuitry, it's noodling around. An exploration of, of something that's so intimate and, and something that's so surprising. It's like aleatoric. Parallel worlds within a circuit that really aren't, don't exist, aren't supposed to exist, I guess, but they're there. So, circuit bending is the act or art or craft of short circuiting electronic devices to create new instruments. We should also mention that this practice is not limited to keyboards. Artists have done work with speak and spells and other vintage children's toys video mixers, Nintendos, and countless other electronic devices. Gazala coined the term circuit bending in about 2004 in his article, The Folk Music of Chance Electronics, Circuit Bending in the Modern Coconut, and published a comprehensive circuit bending book in 2005, outlining philosophies, practices, tutorials, and techniques. While Gazala, and certainly others, have written and spoken in many ways about the practice philosophies of circuit bending, we want to talk about two of them here, focusing specifically on the craft of circuit bending and its relation to rhetoric and composition practices. My technique focuses on everybody. And you know, circuit bending has, it, it's leveled the playing field. 
it has become every man's technique for creating, uh, for prototyping audio circuitry. So that's one of the reasons I think it's spread like wildfire. You don't have to pay for it. Anyone can do it. You can learn it nearly instantly. The, you know, the beauty of circuit bending is that it is not a this wire goes here art. With this wire goes here, you end up with a bunch of uh, replicas or duplications of the same circuit. So that's not what I'm about, and that's not what circuit bending is about. While bending the SK-1, Stephen and I talked a lot about the popularity of this keyboard, primarily because of its affordability for the average consumer in the 1980s, and now found easily at thrift stores and garage sales for about $5. What was interesting to us was the act of taking this mass-produced object and turning it into something personal and handcrafted. While bending the keyboard, it became a unique thing. There is only one SK-1 in the world, with these particular sounds and mannerisms. There are risks and rewards when we play with our new instrument. We compose with it, not on it. We begin to experience some of the joys and failures of the composition process. Invention and arrangement become something other than intentional. We experience something we've begun to call the aesthetics of irregularity. For those in rhetoric and composition circles, this is an interesting way to approach designed communication. It's a way to balance the how-to, technical side of communication with a more rhetorical approach. I'm thinking specifically about how Charles Kostelnik warns that if technology is only a tool, a means to an end, instructors need to be wary about letting it sabotage student learning by truncating the invention process and curbing the student's inclination to think creatively and flexibly about design solutions. Inviting practices like circuit bending in the classroom privilege invention or acts of discovery over convention, or the way things are usually done. Entering the composition process from this place, students are freed from the usual small structured set of conventional forms. Circuit bending decanonizes the process of making. There's no fear of doing something the right way. It helps students enter into conversations about the nature of conventions and rhetorical situations, while it also fosters students' aptitude for creativity and invention. With circuit bending, there, you, there is no presumption because you, you don't know what's going to happen. So you become an immediate part of the music, whatever that might be. And you know, the, there's a challenge to that, but there is, um, I don't know, there's a mystery and a reward to that kind of not knowing uh, what's going to happen. Here, Ghazala discusses the joys of losing control as a composer and a performer and the ways that circuit bending requires one's attention to a collaborative, complex, and highly illogical way of making. In his other work, he articulates the Bia Sape, or Bioelectric Audio Sapien, a hybrid species that emerges as benders make their bodies part of the circuitry. The circuit bender is, quite literally, participating in networks of relation among prefabricated instruments, points on the circuit board, wires, switches, resistors, even the human body. These relations do not yield to the intention of the author. They defy it. They become a new rhetorical situation, a new rhetorical body. Suddenly and clearly, 
The author and instrument are no longer distinct. Posthumanism, actor network theory, object-oriented ontology, and object-oriented rhetoric all echo this awareness, calling for an understanding and practice of rhetoric that accounts for more complex networks of human and non-human agents that co-construct meaning. In sharing this piece on the art and the craft of circuit bending, we hope to invite others into conversations. Conversations about the composing process, especially with regard to invention, intentionality, glitch, and irregularity. Conversations about what happens when you bring circuit bending and other forms of experimental art practices into composition classrooms. And conversations about networks and object-oriented practices specifically how meaning is co-constructed with non-human agents.